Welcome to the Hearst Trading Room Live. My name is David Hickson and today is the 4th of April 2016. As always, before we take a look at the markets, please make sure that you have read and understood these disclaimers. We are going to be uh, taking a slightly different approach to looking at the markets today. And uh, this is an approach that I've worked with uh, for many years. And I thought I would, I would start off the discussion by explaining to you why I started taking this approach to the markets. First of all, it's, it's, it's not a, a deviation from Hearst Cycles. I'm not about to introduce some completely new way of looking at the markets. Uh, I am still going to be discussing Hearst Cycles and Hearst Cycles Analysis. Uh, but this is an approach which has to do with a slightly different way, perhaps, of understanding the charts and the price movements that we analyze. Uh, let me explain the background to this approach to the markets. Uh, I think it might help you to understand how, how I came to discover this slightly different way of looking at the markets. I'm South African, and I started trading many years ago in South Africa. And, uh, of course, I started trading South African shares. And uh, after a while of trading South African shares, I started trading futures contracts in the United States. In those days, and I'm revealing my age here, but in those days, it was quite possible to open an account with a broker in the United States, uh, transfer some South African rands that were still worth something in those days, uh, over to America, and they would be converted into United States dollars, and you could trade um, futures in the U.S., or you could um, buy or sell shares and so on. And uh, so I started doing this, and uh, of course I was analyzing uh, the futures price movement and uh, buying and selling when I thought it was appropriate. Uh, and I started noticing that sometimes I would have a good month in terms of my trading, I would have done quite well, I would have made some profits. But by the time I looked at my account and worked out how much money my account was now worth in terms of South African rands, it was disappointing because even though I had done well with my trading, the exchange rates had fluctuated and uh, as, a result, the, uh, as a result the US dollars were not worth so much to me in terms of South African rands. And so um, uh, uh, what should have been a good month turned into a disappointing month and vice versa sometimes I would have a bad month of trading sometimes I would even lose money in my trading uh, but at the end of the month I came out with a profit in terms of converting that money back into South African rands so it was a, a, a an interesting situation for me because uh, of course I was analyzing the markets using the price data that I had but I thought maybe there's a better way of doing this in terms of me actually making money for myself in South Africa um, as opposed to just having a U.S. account that was, uh, you know, growing. Um, how could I make it work better for me in South Africa? And so what I started doing was I started uh, converting the prices of the futures markets that I traded into South African rands, and I started identifying trading opportunities uh, in those markets, not in US dollars, but in South African rands. And I would make those trades, uh, which were slightly different trades to the trades that I would have made if, um, if I was thinking about my money in terms of US dollars. And that introduced me to this process. So uh, let me explain um, what we're going to be doing today. And I hope that uh, I'm going to introduce you to this uh, approach which is really quite interesting uh, and I hope it's something you're going to be able to apply for yourselves at home. Uh, you're going to be able to take these ideas and play with them and develop them. Um, I'm just going to touch the surface of uh, this way of looking at the markets. Uh, there's, a, th th there's a tremendous amount of detail that one could go into. I won't have time to go into it in, in this webinar today but I hope you're going to find it interesting enough to take some of these ideas home and start playing around with them. Let's start by taking a look at this chart of the S&P 500. Now, uh, this is a chart of the S&P 500. It's the it's the cash index. It's not the futures that we that we often do look at. I often look at the ES futures, 
but uh, this is in fact the S&P 500 cash index. You're probably really familiar with this chart. It it looks, um, I'm sure, very much like uh, you know the kind of charts that you've been seeing in these webinars. Um, week after week and uh, of course you know how this chart works uh, here on the X um, axis that is time moving forward of course and the Y axis here is price and um, so I call it price but let's just hesitate for a moment and, and ask what that means this is an index so what is that price well an index is quoted actually um, as a number all right, it, it, it isn't quoted as dollars or, or anything like that. It's simply quoted as a number. But an index, in this case the S&P 500 index, is compiled out of um, a, a, a whole lot of share prices. So in this case there are 500 company uh, share prices that are combined by means of an algorithm that is unique to the S&P 500 index. And uh, this index shows us um, what the relative value of those shares is. Okay, um, so for instance, Apple, um, if we were to uh, buy shares in Apple, then uh, Apple is quoted in terms of US dollars. All right, you can buy a share in Apple for a hundred and something dollars now. And um, so you would hand over United States dollars and you would get a share in the Apple company. And uh, when you take a whole lot of uh, those different companies and you combine them, then you can come up with an index such as this. The general principle that we are fairly used to is that when the line of price rises, as it uh, did from 2009 right up to the middle of last year, 2015, uh, when that line is rising, then the value of uh, the instrument, or in this case the index, is increasing. But what does that really mean? The, the, what does it mean that the value is increasing? Well, in, in this particular case, because we're considering the U.S. stock market and U.S. companies' share prices are quoted in dollars, what that really means is that the value of the stock market in terms of US dollars has been increasing and when the price uh, line drops when it goes down it means that the value of the stock market as a whole or this average of uh, company shares uh, is decreasing relative to the United States dollar and that's quite an important subtlety, and it's something that you probably don't think about often. Well, I, I certainly never used to think about it very often uh, until I started trading the U.S. stock market uh, as a South African. And I was having a look at the value of my investments in terms of South African rands. And I started having to think about these price charts in a slightly different way. So this price chart, very much like the price chart of a forex pair where you get the relative value between two um, two pairs of uh, currencies uh, two two currencies um, here in in a stock market chart uh, effectively you're doing the same thing what you're looking at is relative value not absolute value it's it's a relative value so uh, in this case the relative value is between the United States stock market or the 500 companies that are included in the S&P 500 index and the United States dollar. That's the relative value. So uh, as a, an analyst and a trader, you are going to be constantly asking yourself the question, should I take the, the money that I have, the United States dollars that I have, and put them in a shoebox under my bed or should I go out and buy some shares in some companies? What is going to be uh, you know, the best way of growing the value of my resources? So uh, in this particular case um, over here, and this is in uh, 2000, I think this is in about 2000. So here in about 2000, you would have done best to have sold your shares in the stock market taken your US dollars and put them under your bed. 
okay, right up until about 2003. And in about 2003, you should have pulled that shoebox out from under your bed and you should have gone out and bought shares in the stock market because the relative value between the US dollar and uh, the stock market was going to uh, change and the stock market was going to increase in value faster than, of course, the US dollar. And uh, then here again in 2007, you should have sold all your shares and converted them back into cash and uh, put your US dollars under your bed. And uh, again in 2009, over here, you should have taken those US dollars and bought shares in the stock market. And uh, uh, potentially in the middle of last year, in 2015, you uh, should have converted them back into dollars. I say potentially because we haven't seen uh, very much of a move yet and there's still some debate as to whether that really was um, uh, you know the the very big peak that uh, that we've been looking at. It's uh, beginning to seem likely the price is heading up into a slightly higher peak, but that's certainly going to be uh, the time to get out. But nevertheless, um, you can see that what we're what we're talking about here is slightly different. We're not just talking about buying and selling shares. When's the right time to buy and when's the right time to sell? What we're talking about is is converting the value. Um, converting your resources from US dollars into shares. It's a subtle point, but it becomes interesting when we introduce a curved ball and we introduce a different possibility. What if instead of selling your shares and getting dollars in return, what if you could sell your shares and get gold in return? Or what if you could use gold to buy shares? So now we have uh, we have three possibilities. And let me just see if I can quickly draw a, a very simple diagram. So in this chart, uh, down here at the bottom, that is where uh, the United States dollar is worth more than the stock market, if you like. Or at least, um, you know, that, that's the, the ultimate US dollar value down there. Up at the top here, is the ultimate stock market value. So the stock market grows in value. What happens is that between the stock market and the United States dollar, uh, as you can see over time, you've got a constant fluctuation of a transfer of value from the United States dollar to the United States stock market. And uh, looked at on the y-axis, that happens uh, along that line over there. Now, what if we introduce a third possibility and this one is gold okay and this over here is the dollar and this over here is the stock market let's um, call it the SP 500 okay now uh, there is a constant fluctuation in value between the gold and dollar of course which you're probably very familiar at looking at because that's simply the gold price because gold prices generally the charts that we analyze gold price is is priced in dollars all right so you can buy an ounce of gold now for one thousand two hundred and twenty five dollars or whatever it is something like that and so uh, there's a constant fluctuation of value and we're used to thinking about that as a fluctuation in the value of gold but in fact, it's a fluctuation in the relative value of gold relative to the dollar. And uh, so you can see what I've drawn here is the beginnings of a triangle. And so there we have, I have completed the triangle. So here we've got the dollar down in this corner over here. Here we've got gold in this corner. And here we've got the US stock market as represented by the S&P 500 up in that corner. Now, uh, the actual value of your resources, if you are switching them between dollars, gold, and the S&P 500, or the stock market, uh, will actually exist somewhere in this space. So when the stock market is very highly valued, you're going to find your value coming over here. Perhaps there's an X indicating uh, you know, that's a very high S&P 500 value. When the S&P 500 uh, loses value relative to gold and gold increases in value relative to the dollar, then you're going to find yourself over there. 
when the best place to have your resources is in the dollar, then you find yourself over there. Of course, most of the time we find ourselves somewhere in between them. But your value of your investments is constantly moving around in this space. Okay, uh, let me clear that. So, what can we do with this concept that we can look at the markets that we're analyzing in terms of either the US dollar value or the gold value? Well, we can look at a chart and we can perform an analysis on that chart and then we can compare those analyses and see whether we can draw any conclusions. Uh, this is a chart of the S&P 500 uh, quoted in dollars. Of course, it's not quoted in dollars, it's simply quoted with a number, but as I've explained, it could be uh, seen as dollars because the value of these shares are in dollars. Let's take a look at the same S&P 500 valued in gold. There it is. So uh, let me just spend a moment explaining how this chart is calculated. Uh, let me go back to the S&P 500 chart that you are uh, probably familiar with. Here we go. This is the normal S&P 500 chart, uh, valued in dollars, if you like. And you can see that on Friday, the uh, closing price was an amount of 2,072.78. And and uh, let's assume that when the S&P 500 was worth 1,000, which was back over here in 2009, uh, when the S&P 500 was worth 1,000, Let's assume that I'd gone out and bought what they call a basket of shares, um, which represents the S&P 500. So I'd uh, got the algorithm for how the S&P 500 is calculated. I'd bought the correct number of shares in each of the 500 companies, and I'd spent $1,000. If I had done that in, in 2009, then on Friday, that $1,000 that, that $1, would now be worth $2,072. That is why I consider this to be a chart uh, valued in dollars. Okay, so my current value of my investment is $2,072. But what if instead I hadn't spent dollars, but I had spent gold? Well, uh, let's turn off that and go over here. Here is the same S&P 500 but valued in gold. So if in 2009, and uh, let's find 2009 on this chart, if in 2009 I'd gone out and spent uh, $1,000 on um, the S&P, uh, thousand dollars worth of gold on the S&P 500, then this is what would have happened, okay? Um, we would have had a very different experience in terms of our investment. So we are still invested in the S&P 500, but we're comparing the value of our investment, not to the United States dollar, but we're comparing the value of our investment to the value of gold. I hope that is clear. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them. Uh, let, let's just uh, talk a little bit about this chart and, and understand why this happened. So in 2009, I went out and I spent my gold on the S&P 500, a basket of shares in the S&P 500. And what happened? Well, the value of my investment in terms of gold went down. Can you see that? It went all the way down until 2011. What is that? Is that August, August, September 2011? Why did my investment in the S&P 500 drop so sharply? Because, of course, the gold price was rising to, uh, to a big peak in 2011. So gold was worth a, a lot in 2011. And my investment in the S&P 500 um, had, had lost value when considered relative to gold. Since 2011, of course, gold has been dropping, and it kept dropping until uh, December of last year. So the value of gold dropped. 
Now, uh, bear in mind, because of this, uh, the, the way that we're now looking at this market, you have to express everything in terms of a relative value. So the value of gold relative to the United States dollar dropped in value. Uh, which meant that the value of the S&P 500 relative to gold increased in value. In fact, it increased in value tremendously. I, I can't actually see on the scale what that is, but that's about uh, 0.5. Um, and I'll, I'll speak in a moment about what these numbers actually mean. Uh, so it went from 0.5 up to 2. So an investment in the S&P 500, when measured in terms of gold, um, increased by, by four times. So if instead of buying my shares in the S&P 500 in September of 2009, or that's about the middle of 2009, if instead I'd waited until the middle of 2011, and transferred my gold investments into S&P 500 investments, then, in fact, the overall value of that investment would have increased four times. It's a, it's a fascinating way of looking at the markets, and there's a lot that you can do with this. Um, uh, I, I'm just touching on the surface of it here. One of the things that you can do is start bringing other possible things into the equation. So uh, let me just show you briefly, and I'm just going to use this chart as a, as a bit of a backing to, to show you the, the idea. Um, let's put the US dollar down here. Let's put the um, S&P 500 up there because that's sort of um, how, how that goes. Then let's put um, gold over here. So that's gold. That's the dollar. That's the SP or the stock market. And then uh, what else could we trade? We could trade oil. Let's put oil over here. Now, um, if you, instead of making your investments in terms of buying and selling shares in the S&P 500, if you instead look at the value space, what I call the relative value space, we now have a, a square or some kind of a um, four-sided shape. Uh, so your value of your investment is going to be constantly uh, moving around within this space. Uh, the way in which it moves is fairly complex, of course, and it makes for a really, really fascinating um, challenge in terms of analyzing it. Um, it's work I've been doing for several years, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing to try to do, to work out where in the relative value space you should be placing your investments. Instead of simply focusing on buying the stock market now, or perhaps buying a bit of gold, um, you instead uh, try to work out where you would like your resources to be in that relative value space. So uh, I see some questions. Uh, uh, Piotr is saying 2011 was it uh, was that uh, I think that's the trough sent in trader predicted as major right yes so now let's start speaking about her cycles analysis and um, I'm going to show you one of the things that you can do with this concept uh, which is that you can use this concept to help you to clarify your analysis just a little bit clearer so let's put an analysis up onto this chart. This is an analysis of the S&P 500. Uh, it's just a default analysis. I'm not going to dwell on it too much. Um, what I've done here is, is I've performed a default analysis uh, with Sentient Trader. I haven't pinned any traps. I haven't created any expert models. I haven't got complicated. I've just asked Sentient Trader to perform a default analysis. And the reason I did that is because Sentient Trader has done something very interesting from its conception actually we started beta testing uh, sentient trader way back here and uh, i started building sentient trader i started working on the software over here in 2005 um, it took me a really long time uh, to build the software as you can see um, but that's uh, that line is, is is when I started working on Sentient Trader. Now this trough in August of 2007, um, throughout late 2007 and in early 2008, there were many Hearst analysts who discussed uh, the possibility that that trough was a trough of the 54-month cycle. And you can see in this analysis 
that Sentient Trader has in fact positioned, that's a bit of a skew arrow, but it has positioned the trough of the 54-month cycle there in August of 2007. And when I was working on Sentient Trader, uh, it started doing uh, these analyses and, and it started doing this even then. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, but if you, if you take a look at this chart now, uh, you might be inclined to say, surely this is an incorrect analysis because here is the big trough in price. That's a really big trough in price. And yet Sentient Trader has said that that is only an 18-month cycle trough, whereas this tiny little trough in August of uh, 2007 has been phased as being the really big, important 54-month cycle trough. Surely there's something wrong. It's a very interesting aspect of Hearst cycles that sometimes uh, troughs seem to have uh, a not adequate amplitude, if you like. It seems to make much more sense to to place that really big cycle trough there in 2009. And certainly in most of the analyses I do, I do that. I, I, uh, I persuade or force Sentient Trader to position the 54-month cycle trough here in 2009 because that is clearly the more important trough. Now, let's take a look at the analysis in terms of the S&P 500 relative to gold. Uh, oh, uh, bef before we do that, let me just point out uh, one other um, r you know, really interesting thing about this analysis. That is that this analysis, because of that funny placement of the 18-month cycle trough in 2009, this analysis has the really important trough. That's a, that's a nine-year cycle trough. It has that trough placed in 2011. Now, if you've been watching these webinars and you've seen the webinars that I have uh, presented with Sid Norris, you'll know that we've discussed uh, the possibilities similar to this. And um, and uh, here, here uh, I'm, I'm presenting something something fairly similar. Uh, so there we have a really big important trough in 2011. Looking at this chart, you. Uh, would probably say, but surely that's impossible. How can the trough really be in 2011? Let's take a look at the chart of the S&P 500 valued in gold, and let's show the phasing analysis here and show our semicircles. And here you can see a phasing analysis, which is in, in many ways very similar. But do you notice the most uh, important prominent trough in this analysis? is a trough of the nine-year cycle. And where is it? It's in 2011. So analyzing the S&P 500 valued as gold is really interesting. So let me just remind you what this means. It means that if you were using gold instead of dollars to buy shares in the S&P 500, then, in fact, the trough of the market, the best time to have bought, would have been in the middle of 2011. That is when you should have taken all your gold and you should have bought shares in the stock market. Okay. Um, of course, you are probably trading dollars. So uh, you might be saying, but I need to analyze a chart um, which shows dollars. Yes, of course you do. But when there are analysis uh, uncertainties, when there are issues, and, and this issue, I must tell you, I, I've been um, you know, working with Sentient Trader for a while, I've been doing Hearst Cycles analyses for a while, and this issue of the placement of the nine-year cycle trough is the sort of debate that comes up again and again. And um, it's, a, it's a really slightly worrying um, issue. Where do you place that nine-year cycle trough? If we consider um, the relative value space instead of simply the uh, value of the S&P 500 against the dollar, then it indicates that 2011 should be uh, the low point of the stock market. Uh, when was the stock market uh, were worth its most. Well, here you can see 
It was in 2000. It was way back in the year 2000. So when was the heyday of the stock market or the U.S. stock market in this in this example? I'm going to show you the DAX in a moment, and uh, and you will see um, uh, that it's similar in the DAX. But um, the best time to have owned shares in the stock market was definitely in 2000. You can see that. You can see that over over there. Okay, if all that you are doing is exchanging US dollars for shares, then yes, of course, you would have achieved a greater value for your investment uh, in the middle of last year. Because if we look at that chart, uh, we have a, a much higher value over there in terms of US dollars. But if you treat your investments in a slightly different way and you start looking at the relative value space, and instead of asking yourself, should I put dollars under my bed or should I go out and buy some shares? Instead, you ask yourself, where should I place my resources? Then using this approach to the markets, you will see that uh, if you considered only the US dollar, the S&P 500 and gold as options, then uh, certainly uh, you should have taken your money out of shares back in 2000. You should have put them into gold because the value of the stock market dropped all the way down until 2011 so for 11 years you were losing money in the stock market which uh, you could have been um, making if you put your money into gold I, I see a question there um, when will the new version of Centin Trader be available Vitaly the new version of Centin Trader is available to current Centin Trader users um, it is still in a beta testing um, version and um, we ha have um, worked out we've worked through uh, pretty much all of the bugs and now we're doing final testing on that and very soon we're going to come up with an exact date okay um piotr says uh, could we see a a, a long-term chart from the 1960s i don't have um long-term in fact i do have long-term data but i don't have a long-term analysis uh here piotr um so uh, but that's certainly something i can come back i can come back and do um let me uh, show you something else because there are two other things that I would like to show you. Um, the first thing I'd like to show you is um, is the DAX. Hello, John. Uh, my analysis supports the idea of a secular high for gold. Yes. So, um, uh, okay, sorry, let me go back to the S&P 500. I've sort of jumped ahead very quickly. Um, what I meant to do before leaving the S&P 500 was uh, let's just zoom in and, and ask what this means about what's happening now. Okay, and um, so what this means is happening now, according to this analysis, is that we have just passed a 54-month cycle trough. Now, this is using the S&P 500 valued in terms of gold okay so uh, what does that mean if we've just passed a 54 month cycle trough and uh, again this is the default analysis I haven't really played around with it very much I haven't influenced it I haven't really double checked it in the way that 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 one should but um, if if we accept the default analysis then what this is saying is that we've just passed a 54 month cycle trough and so uh, we should be transferring our assets out of gold and into the stock market. Does that make sense? Because the relative value between the stock market and gold is bouncing out of a 54-month cycle trough. Okay. Of course, uh, uh, you know we have to we have to keep analysing the situation um, because if we get a symmetrical price movement, then um, it might not be very long that we need to keep that money in the stock market. But certainly, um, according to this analysis, now would be a time to transfer money out of gold and into the stock market, which uh, implies, as John says, it supports the idea of a secular high for gold. Uh, while I'm zoomed into this scale, let me just uh, show you something else. Let me turn off these semicircles and just zoom into this 18-month cycle trough. And let me do the same on the, on the other chart. Uh, this is how I've been working with this concept uh, for many years. Is is I track an analysis in both of uh, both of these 
well, not both, I track many values actually, many relative values. Um, but uh, here's something else that's quite interesting. Uh, we're looking at a chart now of the S&P 500 uh, valued in dollars. So this is the S&P 500 chart that you're used to looking at. And can you see uh, here, um, that's a bit of an analysis anomaly, uh, which is that we had a very long 40-week cycle and then a short 40-week cycle. And that looks like it should clearly be the 40-week cycle. Again, I haven't influenced this analysis. Um, but uh, after price uh, passed this little bump in the road over here, there was a good deal of discussion. In fact, I think I even did a webinar in which I discussed it, um, uh, possibly placing the 40-week cycle trough over here. Okay. And... Um, so could that anomaly or that uncertainty in our analysis have been resolved by looking at the value of the S&P 500 relative to gold? I believe that it could have. Here is the chart of the S&P 500 uh, relative to gold. And can you see that the analysis at the foot of the chart, perhaps I should turn on these semicircles if it doesn't make it too messy. Um, yeah, it's okay. Um, you can see that the analysis at the foot of the chart here is much more regular. Look at these lengths of 40-week cycles. They're almost identical. Okay, uh, there's, there's a 40-week cycle and there's another 40-week cycle. So you've got a very regular analysis. This analysis looks, looks really good. And where has the 40-week cycle trough been placed? It's been placed over here. Now that doesn't mean that that definitely is the trough of the 40-week cycle, but I find it very useful to look at the two analyses and let the one analysis inform the other and uh, help to resolve uh, analysis uncertainties in terms, in terms of what's happening. A final point to make before I leave uh, this chart, and uh, that is that the value of the stock market uh, is clearly now bouncing out of a pretty big cycle trough, possibly a 54-month cycle trough, maybe only an 18-month cycle trough, but it's certainly a, a, a very big cycle trough that the stock market is bouncing out of relative to gold. And so um, if you still have money invested in gold, um, you probably should have a month or two ago transferred that money into the stock market. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, I shouldn't say such such, such um, big statements like that. Uh, what this chart indicates is that the value of the stock market relative to gold is increasing. So uh, the relative value of the stock market is um, is increasing, and of course the stock market has also been increasing relative to the dollar, uh, as you can see over here. And uh, you can you can also see on this chart that the stock uh, the stock market relative to the dollar has been increasing faster than it has relative to gold okay so where should you really have put your money if you had the choice between these three um, instruments the s p 500 gold and the dollar then in about february you should have shifted your money um, away from the dollar and into the stock market and uh, slightly away from gold and into the stock market as well. Uh, the whole concept of relative value investment is a, is a fascinating one, and I could go on about it for a long time, but I won't. Um, I see a few others saying hello, good to see you. Uh, now let's take a look at the DAX, and then we're going to take a look at oil. That's what I've prepared uh, for today. I'll certainly come back, Piotr, and take a look at a long-term chart going all the way back to the 1960s. I'll do that. In fact, I think I've only got gold data going back to 1967, but I'll, I'll get some, my hands on some longer-term uh, data and uh, start looking at that. Right now, this is the DAX, uh, the German DAX, and it's um, an indication of the European stock markets. It looks very similar, of course, to the S&P 500 because of the principle of commonality. Um, uh, this, If you trade the DAX, this is probably a... A chart that you're fairly familiar with and here again the default analysis of the DAX again I haven't messed with this I haven't told Centin Trader what to do but the default analysis of the DAX is placing this big nine-year cycle trough down here in the middle of 2011 
and again. This trough in 2009, the March 2009 trough, is only an 18-month cycle trough. Is that possible? It is possible, yes. Um, is, is this a, a really good analysis? I don't know. Uh, that's a really quite a big debate, but it's um, it's certainly a valid analysis. It doesn't break any rules, and uh, you know it it looks fairly good. We've got a, a nice M shape for our nine-year cycle over there, and as I've mentioned in in previous webinars, we've got a bit of a contracting uh, triangle there, um, possibly a mid-channel pause. Following the mid-channel pause, we expect the break up to the peak, and so on and so forth. Okay, so so this is a fairly valid analysis. Um, although there are some question marks around the placement of the nine-year cycle trough in 2011, let's take a look at the DAX, uh, valued not in terms of the euro, which of course the DAX is, but valued in terms of gold. And here it is. Let me uh, make that like that uh, okay and let's turn the phasing on here as well so here is the DAX valued relative to gold and as you can see we have uh, a really uh, slightly different uh, situation now I drew the M shape of the nine year cycle from 2003 down to 2009 and here's the M shape of that cycle here uh, a much more um, not uh, not not a better M shape really. Um, the previous one was a was a contracting triangle. Here we have a uh, that would be considered a, a descending triangle or a or a descending wedge, perhaps a very long term, long uh, big scale descending wedge. Um, but uh, here again, in terms of the analysis of the DAX, uh, you can see you have a justification for the placing of the nine year cycle trough in 2011. What, what I find or what I've realized over the years is we tend to get very stuck in considering the value of the stock market relative to the currency that we work in, that we lose sight of the fact that that is not really a reflection of the absolute value um, of the stock market. Uh, in fact, of course, an analysis of the stock market relative to gold is also not an absolute reflection of the true value of that stock market. What is the true value of the stock market? Well, um, I'm going to sort of rather spoil things by saying that I don't believe there is one. Um, everything that we work with has to do with relative value. If you think about it, um, uh, I know from experience, uh, as a South African, I know what it feels like to have the value of your currency devalue by three times. Um, in fact, the South African rand is currently around about 17 or 18 rand to the euro. Uh, it wasn't that long ago. It was uh, six rand to the euro. So a devaluation of the currency by threefold um, really makes a very big impact on analysis, uh, in, uh, on investment decisions that you're making. If you're investing in your stock market, and investing in the stock market in South Africa was quite a lot of fun, very volatile, and the South African stock market's been very strong, but if your investment in the South African stock market is based in South African rands, then of course the value of your investment in terms of um, worldwide uh, sort of value has dropped by, uh, by value, you know, by uh, threefold perhaps. Okay, I see a few other questions there. Uh, 2011 was the secular high but gives a bearish tilt to gold. Okay, so 2011 is the secular high for gold and giving it a bearish tilt. Um, gold analysis, I don't think that's God analysis. I think that's gold analysis. We won't try and analyze God in these uh, webinars. It's projecting an important high in 2019, so it's a good analysis. Great. Piotr, stock market valued in an average day of labor. Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting concept. So, um, so uh, you work out, uh, I think what Piotr is saying is you, you, you know, work out what an average day of labor is worth in terms of what you would be paid perhaps or, or what, um, uh, what an average person would be paid for a day of labor, a day of their work. And uh, then you start analyzing the stock market in terms of that instead of in terms of 
in terms of gold. A very interesting concept. I hope you're beginning to see that this idea, this approach, is one that can be developed and extended upon. As I've mentioned, I'm really just touching on the surface in, in this webinar. Uh, it's, a, it's a really useful concept. Um, I've had uh, many people come to me over the years uh, saying, I have a, a basket of investments. Could you tell me uh, which ones I should buy and which ones I should sell and, um, and when I should do that? And it's a, it's a fairly simple and straightforward question, and the answer should be fairly simple and straightforward. But the best way, in my opinion, of looking at it is by uh, looking at this concept of relative value. As soon as you start doing that, it becomes a lot more complicated, but a lot more useful. After you start applying this concept of relative value, um, you, you're, you're going to find the, the value of your investments actually uh, increases dramatically, not just in terms of your currency, but in terms of your, your actual, um, uh, uh, you know, your actual value, which of course brings up the question of, of how do you, how do you value things? Um, I, I, I did a bit of work with somebody for a while who um, took the price of, of a can of Coke, of Coca-Cola, and um, and they used that as the measure of value. And uh, it was quite an interesting exercise. I guess it sort of reflects the um, uh, cost of living to some extent. Um, uh, that we, we also did some exercises in terms of the average price of a loaf of bread. So uh, you could choose to you know, buy 100 loaves of bread or one share in apple. Or, you probably get more than one share. I mean, you probably get more than a hundred loaves of bread, but uh, nevertheless, that was the exercise. Uh, so you, you know, you could you could analyze anything. You could analyze gold or or the stock market in terms of how many loaves of bread that was worth. Uh, it's a very interesting process. Let's quickly take a look at gold again. This is a chart that I expect you're familiar with. Gold, uh, not gold, um, oil. I beg your pardon. This is crude oil. Um, valued in terms of dollars, of course, here's Friday's close. Is that Friday's close? $38.33, cents, something like that. And of course, um, our Y scale, when it goes up, it means it means oil is worth a lot of money. It's worth a lot of US dollars. It goes all the way up to um, 150 US dollars for a barrel of oil and uh, all the way down to you know the recent price of 25 or something like that. And uh, all the way down over here, it, go, it drops down to to uh, ten dollars to the barrel or something like that. Uh, so this is uh, again the chart that you, that you're fairly familiar with, I'm sure. And if I show a phasing, and again I've just chosen to use the default phasing here, uh, but you can see um, here that the trough that formed in January of this year is being phased as a trough of 18 month magnitude. It is indicating. Uh, future lower prices for oil but again this is not a, a, a detailed analysis that i've really deeply considered is the default analysis uh, what i wanted to show you was the difference when you consider oil relative to gold instead of oil relative to the united states dollar so here is the chart of oil relative to gold of course there are uh, many similarities um uh, obviously a great many similarities because we're looking at the same instrument we're looking at at oil but we're considering in in investing in oil instead of gold so we're valuing oil in terms of amount of gold um, I did mention I would speak about these numbers at the right hand side of the chart and I should probably do that now uh, the actual numbers here are um, an indication of uh, how much gold you would get for one barrel of oil. Um, but uh, it's not in ounces. And in fact, in order to to get these uh, numbers more sort of legible and e easy to read, I've multiplied the calculation by a thousand, I think, or, or something like that. Um, so you can see uh, that at the moment, one barrel of oil would fetch us 29.987 uh, thousandth of an ounce of gold. 
So it's not really very much gold, um, but uh, nevertheless, the important thing is the relative value. Okay, so those numbers on the right-hand side of the chart aren't particularly meaningful, but they do give you an idea of how much gold you could get in return for your barrels of oil. Okay, so uh, the interesting thing that I wanted to point out about this analysis of, uh, of oil, let's just uh, zoom in over here, is how sometimes analyzing an instrument relative to gold or, or relative to anything else really um, can uh, help to resolve some analysis uncertainties apart from being uh, simply a, a very useful tool. And let's have a look at, at this analysis. In fact, uh, before I do let, let me just zoom in even further and point out a few interesting things about this analysis. Now, um, you probably have seen the webinar that I did with John in which we discussed oil. And John uh, spoke about the nominal model that he uses to analyze oil. And I believe that was a 14-month cycle uh, that he was speaking uh, about in there as well as then a 30-week cycle and I don't know if you can see these numbers on the right hand side of the chart but uh, this is not using that nominal model this is using what I call the default nominal model which starts with a wavelength of 18 months but uh, it has found wavelengths of 16 months and 29.5 weeks uh, which gives further support to the concept that, in fact, a shorter nominal model is at work in the relative value of oil. So um, that's uh, another useful feature of of working with this uh, with this approach to the markets. The other uh, thing that I find particularly useful about this analysis and this chart is that again these cycles are very regular they have been recently very regular can you see how the yellow cycles all come up to the same height the green cycles all come up to roughly the same height and and so on uh, all the way down to the shorter cycles that's an indication that the cycles have been very clear in this market in other words the relationship in value between oil and gold has exhibited very clear cyclical um, characteristics. The cycles have been very clear in this. Now, of course, there aren't very many people that um, analyze the relative value of oil and gold. Uh, there are many people that analyze oil and many people that analyze gold. Not many people uh, that I'm aware of analyze the relationship between them. But isn't it um, really interesting how clear those cycles are? And, uh, of course, those cycles are telling us the relative value of of oil versus gold uh, but we can take that uh, that information that we gain from that analysis and we can zoom in and we can take a look at the same sort of time frame over here uh, let me let me just go back where was that was that something like that no more like that and uh, we can uh, you know, apply that information to help us resolve any uh, any potential analysis discrepancies uh, that we have in uh, this chart over here. The the other thing that is uh, quite interesting is the concept of trend lines, and I'm going to let you just go home and play with these ideas. But uh, if we draw a trend line across the price of of oil relative to the United States dollar, then that trend line, I believe, was crossed over here in March, indicating that uh, potentially, you know, the long uh, cycle trough has formed in oil. Uh, it's then useful to go to the chart of oil versus gold, so oil valued in gold, and take a look at that same trend line and see whether gold has managed to break that trend line. And I've drawn a really bad trend line there, but in fact it doesn't look as if though it has. So that's another really useful thing to do, is to monitor your VTLs and your trend lines and, uh, and do that um, here on your charts. I wonder whether we can show a VTL quickly of... Um, what cycle would that be? The 18-month cycle... 
there we go. There's the there's the trend line for the 18 month cycle. Um, it's going all the way back to here. Uh, perhaps it, I should show the 40 week cycle. Um, yeah. Okay. So there's the f there's the 40 week cycle uh, trend line VTL I should say, and can you see how um, it doesn't actually look as if though that trend line has been breached. Uh, that's really the point I wanted to make about that. So um, that's a, another really useful thing to do is to have a look at your trend lines on these charts and consider whether the uh, trend line in terms of oil or any instrument relative to gold has been broken uh, when the trend line of oil or any instrument relative to the United States dollar uh, possibly has. Let's see if we can see this trend line here. The 40 week yes there we go that that demonstrates uh, quite clearly i think what i was trying to show which is that the 40 week trend line uh, for oil relative to the dollar was quite clearly and strongly broken over here uh, in late february okay so that gives us a little bit of uh, extra insight by uh, means of taking a look at oil relative to gold and we're able to to see that that trend line hasn't been broken. And so maybe that trough, um, you know, shouldn't yet really be uh, considered to be a very important trough. Let's take a look at some of our VTLs. Oh, no, let's look at a longer term VTL. Um, so uh, FLD, I beg your pardon. So there's the 40 week cycle FLD. Let's see if we've got any FLDs that price is interacting with at the moment. Yes, here we go. So here's oil relative to the dollar. You can see it's just broken up above the 20 week cycle FLD. And let's go and take a look at the same thing, oil against gold. And take a look at the 20 week cycle FLD. The 20 week cycle FLD over here was broken uh, way back at the end of February. So uh, really interesting uh, information, I believe, which can be gleaned from considering uh, these these charts. And that uh, brings us to the end of today's webinar. Um, I hope you found it really interesting to consider the uh, possibility of approaching a market in a slightly different way in terms of looking at your analysis not only in terms of the price against the US dollar but also in terms of price against gold or perhaps price against oil you know look at the stock market relative to the oil price and um, uh, look at the price of gold relative to um, to oil perhaps and uh, instead of simply considering whether to convert your dollars into shares or your euros into shares uh, consider uh, where in the relative value space you should be placing your investments. It makes for a uh, for a fascinating approach, a very profitable approach. I must tell you, um, as a South African, when I started trading American markets, I was so much at the mercy of the very volatile, fluctuating South African rand that my investments. Um, uh, you know, were, uh, were almost meaningless in the face of the fluctuation of the rand against the US dollar. It was only once I finally started understanding the concept of the relative value space that I was able to uh, you know, really make my investments make more sense in terms of the life I was living and what I was using to, to um, further my progress through life. So uh, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I do hope you found it useful and valuable. And I look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. We'll be back in two weeks' time and um, uh, discussing Hearst Cycles again. In the meantime, I wish you, of course, profitable trading. And I look forward to seeing you on the next webinar.